Hey guys, so it's time for uh, possibly one of the game captures I'm the most excited about, and that is the Mass Effect series. Realistically, this series is one of the main reasons why I'm even doing game, game captures in the first place. It is an amazingly well-written, well-told story. It is actually probably one of my favorite game franchises of all time. It's made by a company called BioWare, uh, which is based in my hometown of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And uh, when they started developing the Mass Effect series, they conceived from the very beginning that it was going to be a trilogy. And it was a very ambitious project because what it was going to be is it was going to be a trilogy with one continuous story the whole way through and your actions in one game would actually carry over into the next. So, realistically, you can consider it like one game in three parts. Um, so, very ambitious project because nobody had done anything even remotely like it ever since. Like, the amount of coordination that needed to go into making sure your decisions carry over, extraordinary amount of effort. Uh, and at the time, BioWare was an independent studio. Uh, they had done a lot of... Um, work for other companies, like for example, they'd made Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic for LucasArts, um, or they'd done other games along those lines. Mass Effect was one of their first entirely original intellectual properties, um, and like I said, very ambitious project, especially for an independent studio like BioWare was at the time. Um, after Mass Effect 1 came out, but before Mass Effect 2 came out, Bioware was bought by EA, Electronic Arts, and so with that new ownership, Bioware got a hell of a lot better budget and more resources available to them to develop games like uh, Mass Effect 2 and Mass Effect 3. Uh, so. It's, you're going to really see like their capabilities, like their animation, their modeling, um, like the scale of the project really ramps up as the series progresses because of what they learn and what they have available to them at, at that time. Uh, so, a few things for those who are, are necessarily unaware. There's a lot of information in the Mass Effect universe. Like, it is one of the most well-developed universes, fictional universes, I have ever seen. There is so much information, like galactic civilization, the, in, the different alien races, what, how their cultures work, what, what, how their physiology, their biology works, everything like that. There is so much information, and it is so well-developed. Most of the information is available through what they call a codex. So as you go through the game and you encounter something, they add a codex entry, which is like a journal entry like or a log, which basically is a written thing that tells you about that thing. Now, I know things like that are not interesting to watch, so I am not going to include codex entries in this playthrough. Instead, I'm going to focus on the cinematic aspect, the storytelling aspect, the action aspect of this game. So a few things that might help you understand the universe better going into it. First of all, you play Commander Shepard, and you this is a game that really took character creation to a whole new level, because you get to choose like the background, uh, you get to choose you know what kind of character now, to a certain extent, some of it's pretty formulaic. Uh, for example, the character class. There's three basic character classes, Soldier, Engineer, and Adept. Now, in the Mass Effect universe, there's something called Biotics, where uh, certain individuals have the ability to manifest Mass Effect fields, and, and you'll understand this a bit better as the game progresses. Uh, using their mind. It, it's kind of like the sci-fi version of magic, but it's actually based on theoretical science, right? Um, so Mass Effect fields, just to give you a little bit of a primer, a Mass Effect field is a field produced which can alter the mass of what's in it either up or down. So, for example, if you want to travel really, really, really fast, simply use a Mass Effect field to reduce your mass to next to nothing. Since your mass has next to no value, 
you can go really, really fast with a lot less effort than if your mass was really, really high. Uh, but by the same token, in things like combat, uh, you can use mass effect fields, take your enemy, increase their mass hugely so they just flop down, or decrease their mass so they start floating up into the air, things like that. Or use mass effect fields to push them back. So it's kind of like the sci-fi version of, of, um, of magic. Uh, basically, and it's based around a, uh, a fictional element called Element Zero. So, Element Zero is necessary for the creation and uh, application of Mass Effect fields. So, soldiers have lots of like armor they can use, the heaviest armor, they can use every type of weapon effectively. Uh, engineers can use tech skills like uh, hacking, decrypting, um, like if you want to open and unlock a door using the electronic lock, you can hack it or, or decrypt it, so on and so forth, um, but are fairly fragile and not, you know, combat focused. Uh, adepts are biotic focused, so they can pack a lot of uh, biotic punch, but they're not so good in the actual combat, combat aspect. Uh, then there's three other classes, which are kind of like uh, cross classes. There are infiltrators, which are a combination of engineers and soldiers. There are um, vanguards, which are combinations of soldiers and adepts. And, oh shoot, I can't remember the name of the, of the last one, but it uh, it's a combination of biotic and tech. So, those are the six basic classes. Now, it does kind of fall into the warrior, thief, mage standard three class archetype um, with cross classes included. Personally, I have two characters that I play. I play uh, a Vanguard, Paragon, and I'll get into Paragon versus Renegade a bit in a bit. I play a, a, a Vanguard, Paragon, or I play an Infiltrator, Renegade. Now, Paragon versus Renegade, Bioware games are famous and have always had morality systems. One of the things that Mass Effect did, which was kind of cool, and it was uh, fairly innovative at the time, uh, good actions are the, what they call like Paragon, or what, like Paragon actions are what we would normally consider good is is a is a better way to think about it. Whereas Renegade actions are actions which are what we would normally consider uh, bad or evil, right? Unlike a lot of games which have morality systems. Bioware did something really kind of cool with Mass Effect, and they made the Paragon scale and the Renegade scale scale completely separate from one another. Just because you gain Renegade points does not take away from your Paragon points, or vice versa. Some actions e I even give you both, or take away both. So you can have points in both Renegade and Paragon, so they kind of made it less binary and, and more gradiented, and that, I thought that was really kind of cool. So, uh, you can, like I said, you can also cho choose the, uh, the history of your character. The character I'm going to be playing through is my uh, Vanguard Paragon, and I have Commander Shepard as a uh, ruthless war hero, I believe is, is what it is. Um, had I, uh, no sorry, a ruthless spacer. Um, so what you can do is you can choose like personality type is ruthless, soul survivor, and war hero, uh, and that kind of like affects your history and like people's like your reputation. When you approach a character and they recognize you and they like they know your history, what what how do they see you? Do they see you as the tragic soul survivor of a, of a catastrophe? Uh, do they see you as somebody who gets the job done at any cost? Do they see you as somebody who like really saved the day in this one time, right? And then you get to choose like how, how you grew up. A spacer is like uh, a navy kid. So both your parents were in the were in the navy. You grew up in space, go, jumping from place to place, so on and so forth. Uh, the other two options are colonists. So you grew up on one of the planetary colony colonies that uh, humanity has founded, or earthborn, which means you were born and raised on Earth, right? So. Uh, I created my Vanguard Paragon as a uh, ruthless spacer. Um, if I was doing it again today, just because of the way I play it, I probably wouldn't have chosen ruthless. I probably would have chosen war hero. Uh, just in retrospect, um, so you, the choices I kind of make don't necessarily match up with my reputation because of that. So just as as a heads up, that's a little bit of something you're going to see. So on that note, 
you are not seeing a brand new game. You are going to be seeing a, what's called a new game plus, which means I've already beat the game with this character. I already have a whole bunch of armor and weapons and equipment and skills, and the characters are already fully leveled up going into the very beginning of the game. Um, now, here's why. Here's part of why I do that. One, I pl like I love this game so much. I've played it so many times. I play the game on insanity difficulty, which is the highest difficulty setting available. There's like um, there's easy, normal, hard, um, hardcore. I think there's one other one, and then there's insanity. So I play at the absolute highest difficulty setting because I love this game so much. I've played it so much. I want it to still provide a challenge for me. So having that advanced armor and weapons and equipment and levels helps me not die. <laughs> Um, but also, uh, I, you, I am going to die fairly frequently because it, at insanity, it can be hard. <laughs> like, it takes a lot to take an enemy, some of the, especially some of the, uh, the bigger enemies, it takes a lot to take them down. Uh, some other thing, so one other thing I just want to kind of touch on, there's a part where you kind of get control of, of a ship and you get to do, like, planetary exploration. One of the things that I loved about the original Mass Effect, but a lot of people didn't, was the fact that when you do planetary exploration, the planets are big and empty. Now, the reason I love that is because that's how it would actually be. If we go out into space, we go to Mars, we establish a colony on Mars, guess what? We're the only ones there. There's nothing else around. <laughs> uh, there might be, like, mineral deposits or things like that, uh, and you can find those, but there's nothing. There's going to be nothing between the colony and the mineral deposit. There's not going to be some other group of people hanging around there unless some other group of people went there. So the fact that the planets are big and empty, I love that because it added to the sense of realism of the game. It's like this is how space or exploration would actually be. Having said that, some people found it boring. Understandable. And I can also understand how that might be boring from a viewer perspective given that you are not playing the game you are simply watching the game and as such in these sections when I have big empty worlds I am going to go with more of a montage style or uh, um, a highlights reel I'm not going to show you show you me driving across an endless field I'm going to show you me approaching the mineral deposit claiming it and moving on uh, Every planet has a mission of some sort on it, so that will also be included as well. Uh, or at least almost every planet, I, I, I'm pretty sure. I think it's every planet, but I'm, I can't, not 100% sure. Uh, having said that, there are some very big, bad, dangerous alien life forms on these planets. You will also get to see me fight those. <laughs> so, uh, as, as I'm sure you can tell, I'm a little bit excited about this game because I love this game series so much. You may notice I'm actually even wearing a Mass Effect t-shirt. N7, what you see here, is uh, a designation, is, is basically Commander Shepard's designation within the Systems Alliance, which is like the Earth government, right? Uh, in, in, in the military. The N means, uh, is the designation for like the, uh, like the Special Forces. Um, 7 is, uh, because within each designation, within each letter, there's a uh, 1 to 7 indicating levels of proficiency. So, Commander Shepard is Special Forces Level 7, so basically the top of the top in the, spe in the Special Operations Special Forces part of the Humanity Alliance. Uh, on my sh shoulder here, you'll see like the red stripe with the white border. That is kind of uh, iconic of uh, Commander Shepard's armor. Commander Shepard's armor has this down it, uh, down the one uh, arm, uh, or the default armor anyway, has that. Um, as you get other armor, sometimes you, you don't get that pattern. Uh, but this is the uh, the iconic uh, Commander Shepard pattern, as it were. So I'm actually wearing this specifically for this. Uh, I'm a little bit excited about this because I love this game series so much. It is such an amazingly well-told story in such an amazingly well-developed universe that I really hope you enjoy it as well. Uh, now, the reason it took me a little while to do this particular game is because this is a Windows-based game, not a, cons a console-based game, hence why I'm not in my usual place. Um, and I had to get set up. Let's have the proper equipment to be able to do this. 
So now I have that, I'm finally able to show you this game I love so much, which has one of the best stories ever. I am going to show you the entire trilogy, Mass Effect 1, Mass Effect 2, and Mass Effect 3, straight through. I'm going to go like start to finish, and I hope you join me for the ride because it's an amazing one. And uh, let's get to it, alright? See you later. Hey guys, so sorry, before we actually get started, there's one thing I forgot to mention in that uh, earlier uh, little clip. Uh, something which may catch some people by surprise is that I, my Vanguard Paragon Shepard, uh, Commander Shepard, is a female Commander Shepard. I prefer to play the game as Femshep, as the fans affectionately call her. There's a few reasons for that. Uh, first of all, I find the story more interesting with a female protagonist uh, than I do with the male pr protagonist. I don't, not entirely sure why, it's just, it's something I, I feel, it makes the story a lot more interesting. Number two is the voice acting. Jennifer Hale is the voice actress who plays female Commander Shepard. Mark Mir is the voice actor who plays the male Commander Shepard. Uh, both of which have worked with Bioware in the past, uh, I believe, um, but I prefer Jennifer Hale's performance to Mark Mears' performance, which is not to say that Mark Mears' performance is bad. As a matter of fact, Mark Mears' performance as Commander Shepard is very, very good. But Jennifer Hale just knocked it out of the park. Her voice acting performance as Commander Shepard is flippin' fantastic. It is absolutely amazing. And so... For those two reasons, the fact that I find the story more interesting with a female protagonist, and the fact that uh, Jennifer Hale just did such an amazing job with the voice acting, that's why I'm playing Commander Shepard as a female. What that actually affects in the game, uh, and one of the things that Mass Effect has been actually very, very praised for, is not much. Uh, that's kind of the whole point. It doesn't, like, um, the video game industry is kind of on occasion gets a bit uh, controversial regarding its uh, treatment of female characters and the Mass Effect trilogy whether you're playing Commander Shepard as a female or as a male it makes almost no difference whatsoever there's not there's no ad any additional prejudice there's no um, objectification there's no difference in capabilities it is literally just yeah she's a female so what and I, I think that was kind of awesome. Um, so that's why I'm playing it as Femshep, just so it doesn't catch you guys as a surprise. Um, it never actually gets said in the name, but you do get to choose a first name for your Commander Shepard when you create the character. And so just for the record, my Commander Shepard is named Caitlin Shepard. So, all right, that's it. Let's actually get to it now, all right? Welcome to Alliance Military Database. Classified information requested. Establishing secure connection. Secure connection confirmed. Well, what about Shepard? She's a spacer, lived aboard starships most of her life. Military service runs in the family. Both her parents were in the Navy. She got most of her unit killed on Torfin. She gets the job done, no matter what the cost. Is that the kind of person we want protecting the galaxy? That's the only kind of person who can protect the galaxy. I'll make the call.
Arcturus Prime relays in range. Initiating transmission sequence. Commander. We are connected. Calculating transit mass and destination. The relay is hot. Acquiring approach vector. All stations secure for transit. Thrusters, check. Navigation, check. Internal emission sync engaged. All systems online. Drift, just under 1500k. 1500 is good. Your captain will be pleased. I hate that guy. Nihilus gave you a compliment. So you hate him. You remember to zip up your jumpsuit on the way out of the bathroom? That's good. I just jumped us halfway across the galaxy and hit a target the size of a pinhead. So that's incredible. Besides, specters are trouble. I don't like having them on board. Call me paranoid. You're paranoid. The Council helped fund this project. They have a right to send someone to keep an eye on their investment. Yeah, that is the official story. But only an idiot believes the official story. And they don't send specters on shakedown runs. So there's more going on here than the captain's letting up. Joker, status report. Just cleared the mass relay, Captain. Stealth systems engaged. Everything looks solid. Good. Find a comm buoy and link us into the network. I want mission reports relayed back to Alliance Brass before we reach Eden Prime. Aye, aye, Captain. Better brace yourself, sir. I think Nihilus is headed your way. He's already here, Lieutenant. Tell Commander Shepard to meet me in the comm room for a debriefing. You get that, Commander? He sounds angry. Something must have gone wrong with the mission. <laughs> Captain always sounds like that when he's talking to me. Can't possibly imagine why. All right, so a couple quick things just before we get started. First of all, yes, that is Seth Green playing the pilot, Jeff Joker Moreau. Second of all, one of the things that the Mass Effect series uh, really kind of pioneered was this idea of uh, cinematic conversation systems. So in video games prior to this, the standard conversation system was the computer character would say what they have to say, and then you get a list of like four or five options. You choose what you want to say, and then the conversation continues. And what that led to was a very start-stop style conversation system. It was like, blah, 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 blah. Let me read, let me read, let me read, let me read. Oh, blah, blah, Oh, blah, 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 blah. Let me read, let me read, let me read, let me read. Oh, blah, 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 blah. And so what they wanted is they wanted to create a much smoother conversation system, a much more naturally flowing, a much more cinematic conversation system. So you may have noticed a little wheel pop up in the bottom middle of the screen. Uh, that is their new conversation system. They, they streamlined it to what is the gist of what you're trying to get at and uh, the wheels divided into six sections there's the left half and the right half uh, and then there's top middle and bottom so top options are generally paragon options generally speaking so not always depends on the situation top options are generally paragon bottom options are generally renegade middle options are generally middle of the road left Conversate, well, I guess to you guys it would be left conversation options are tell me more. Let's go more in detail on this subject matter. Whereas right conversation options are let's get to the end of it. Let's let's go. Let's let's wrap this up. So they kind of divided it into these six segments. And as it's getting to the point where your character has an input, that kind of that wheel kind of pops up as the computer character is still saying what they're saying so you can 
say, well, this is the gist of what I'm feeling. This is what I want to say. And then you just select it. And then when it comes time, your character just steps in naturally with no delay. And that leads to a much more fluid conversation system. So, uh, yeah, just wanted to point that out. Let's get to it. Getting dragged right along with him. Relax, Presley. You're gonna give yourself an ulcer. Congratulations, Commander. Looks like we had a smooth run. You heading down to see the captain? Sounds like you don't trust our Turian guest. Sorry, Commander. Just having a chat with Adams down at Engineering. I didn't mean to cause any trouble. But you have to admit, something's odd about this mission. The whole crew feels it. You think the Alliance brass is holding out on us? If all we're supposed to do is test out the stealth system, why is Captain Anderson in charge? And then there's Nihilus. Spectres are elite operatives, top covert agents. Why send a Spectre, a Turian Spectre, on a shakedown run? It doesn't add up. What do you know about the stealth systems? I just know it masks our location from scans and sensors, cutting edge technology. The Normandy's the only ship with this prototype drive. But why are we fully staffed? A skeleton crew would be cheaper, less chance of security leaks, too. Plus, there's Nihilus. It's pretty obvious this shakedown run is just a cover. For what? Damned if I know, Commander. We're out here on false pretenses. I'm not a fan of being left in the dark. Do you have a problem with the Captain? No, ma'am. But I can't figure out what he's doing here. Captain Anderson is one of the most decorated Special Forces officers in the service. If he melted down all his medals, he could make a life-size statue of himself. You don't send a soldier like that on a do-nothing mission. He's treating this shakedown run too seriously. Something big is going on. You don't trust Nihilus. I don't like Turians in general. It runs in my family. My grandfather fought in the first contact war. Lost a lot of friends when the Turians hit us. That was 30 years ago. You can't blame Nihilus for that. No, I guess not. But it still makes me nervous to have a Spectre on board. Especially a Turian. We're an Alliance vessel, human military, but Nihilus doesn't answer to the Captain like the rest of us. Spectres operate outside the normal chain of command. And they don't come along just to observe shakedown runs. <laughs> Nihilus looks like he's expecting some heavy action. I don't like it. I'll see if I can get some answers when I see him. Good luck, Commander. Okay, another quick thing. Just a quick rundown of some of the alien races out there. Turians which are Nihilus, what you saw on the bridge, the one who gave uh, Joker a compliment, and then Joker said, I hate that guy. Uh, Turians are uh, a militaristic race. Uh, like, the government and the military are, like, one and the same. Every Turian has, like, a strong sense of duty kind of built into them. Uh, I believe their lifespan is roughly similar to humans. Um, so humans kind of see them as, uh, as stiff and uptight and rigid, whereas Turians tend to see humans as, as reckless and carefree and, and overly aggressive. Um, another species that you're going to see are the Asari. The Asari are a monogendered race. They only have one gender uh, that live, and they live for a thousand years. Uh, that's the average lifespan of an Asari. Uh, they do take partners for reproduction, but physical contact may or may not be involved. What the Asari kind of do the Asari take their partner and use their partner's genetics, as it were, as a randomizer for their own genetics when producing offspring. So that's kind of cool. Uh, they're kind of a, a peaceful, cultured, slower-paced race because of their thousand-year lifespan, uh, at least in the perception of other alien races, which is in stark contrast to the Solarians. Solarians kind of look a bit like geckos, uh, they have a very short lifespan compared to the other alien races. Uh, they only live for about 40 years. The, and that short lifespan kind of gives them a very outside-the-box, fast-thinking uh, kind of personality. So, like, scientists and engineers, hugely prominent Solarian presence there because of their outside-of-the-box, figure-things-out, quick-working mentality. Um... The other race, uh, which you're going to see, is the Krogan. 
Now, Krogan don't live quite as long as Asari, they, but they do live for several centuries. Uh, Krogan are big, hulking beasts. Um, they have several redundant organs and everything like that. And if you actually read the codex on their planet of origin, it's a planet called Tuchanka. Basically, everything on Tuchanka is trying to kill you. Everything. Every animal is a vicious predator. Every plant has toxins, and some of them even eat animals. Um, so it's basically... Tuchanka is an incredibly hostile environment, and for any life to survive on Tuchanka, it has to be super hardy. Uh, hence, the Krogans. They're kind of the heavy hitters of the Mass Effect universe. Uh, so just... And then, of course, there's the humans. Um, so just kind of a, a quick overview of some of the alien races you're going to see, uh, just because it's already kind of come up. Now, they kind of mentioned the first contact war. Bit of history, because I, I don't think they go into detail with that there. When uh, humanity first discovered interstellar travel, uh, the first alien race that they encountered was the Turians, which spurred the first contact war. Um... The way the Turians see it is, hey, here's this young, fledgling race taking their first steps into intergalactic space. And uh, they say they're trying to just, they're going around and exploring and discovering everything there. The Turians kind of saw that as a child approaching a gun. And so uh, if you saw a child approaching a gun, you would try and stop them. That's what the Turian, that's how the Turians see it. What the, how the humans see it is, well, they didn't even ask questions. They just shot at us. <laughs> and so we shot back. And thus spurring the first contact war. Uh, so just a little bit of history there. Let's get to it, okay? I grew up on East Prime Dock. It's not the kind of place Spectres visit. There's something Nihilus isn't telling us about this mission. That's crazy. The captain's in charge here. He wouldn't take orders from a Spectre. Not his choice, Doc. Spectres don't answer to anyone. They can do whatever they want. Kill anyone who gets in their way. Oh, you watch too many spy vids, Jenkins. What do you think, Commander? We won't be staying on Eden Prime too long, will we? I'm itching for some real action. I sincerely hope you're kidding, Corporal. Your real action usually ends with me patching up crew members in the infirmary. You need to calm down, Corporal. A good soldier stays cool even under fire. Sorry, Commander, but this waiting's killing me. I've never been on a mission like this before, not one with a Spectre on board. Just treat this like every other assignment you've had and everything will work out. Easy for you to say. You proved yourself on Torfin. Everybody knows what you can do. This is my big chance. I need to show the brass what I can do. You're young, Corporal. You have a long career ahead of you. Don't do something stupid to mess it up. Don't worry, ma'am. I'm not gonna screw this up. What can you tell me about Nihilus? Turians are generally well respected by the other species. Their fleet has more patrols protecting Citadel space than any other. They don't always get on well with us, though. Some people find them too rigid. Others still blame them for the first contact war. As for Nihilus, I haven't said more than two words to him. He usually only speaks to the captain. I hope we get a chance to see him in action. I heard Nihilus took down an entire enemy platoon all by himself. What do you know about the Spectres? Only what I've heard. Spectre agents work directly for the Citadel Council. They usually work alone or in small groups. Spectres don't have any official power, though. Basically, they're a shadow organization with a mandate to preserve and protect galactic stability. Protect it at any cost. Don't forget that part. Spectres operate above the law. Why don't we have any of our own people in there? Spectres usually come from the Council races. Like the Turians. We've been trying to get a human accepted into their ranks for years now. So far, it hasn't happened. Hey, Commander, you'd make a good Spectre. What you did on Torfin, that's what they're looking for. Success at any cost, ruthless efficiency, show no mercy. I didn't enjoy Torfin. I just did what I had to do. No, I, I, I didn't mean... Sorry, Commander. Th that just came out wrong. I never meant any disrespect. This is all just wild speculation. The Spectres aren't interested in recruiting humans, no matter how capable. You're from Eden Prime, aren't you, Jenkins? What's it like? It's very peaceful, Commander. They've been real careful with development, so you don't have any city noise or pollution. My parents lived on the outskirts of the colony. At night, I used to climb this big hill and stare across the fields back at the lights from the main settlement. 
was gorgeous. But when I got older, I realized it was a little too calm and quiet for me. That's why I joined the Alliance. Even Paradise gets boring after a while. Any idea why Eden Prime was chosen as our destination? Not really sure, Commander. Eden Prime's one of our most stable colonies. Good place to take the Normandy for a shakedown run, I guess. No real danger there. But there's gotta be something else going on. We've got a Spectre on board. That's why I'm so wound up. I can't wait for the real mission to start. The Captain's waiting for me. Goodbye, Commander. Commander Shepard, I was hoping you'd get here first. It will give us a chance to talk. The Captain said he'd meet me here. He's on his way. I'm interested in this world we're going to. Eden Prime. I've heard it's quite beautiful. They say it's a paradise. Yes, a paradise. Serene, tranquil, safe. Eden Prime has become something of a symbol for your people, hasn't it? Proof that humanity can not only establish colonies across the galaxy, but also protect them. But how safe is it, really? Do you know something? Your people are still newcomers, Shepard. The galaxy can be a very dangerous place. Is the Alliance truly ready for this? I think it's about time we told the Commander what's really going on. This mission is far more than a simple shakedown run. I figured there was something you weren't telling us. We're making a covert pickup on Eden Prime. That's why we needed the stealth systems operational. There must be a reason you didn't tell me about this, sir. This comes down from the top, Commander. Information strictly on a need-to-know basis. A research team on Eden Prime unearthed some kind of beacon during an excavation. It was Prothean. I thought the Protheans vanished 50,000 years ago. Their legacy still remains. The mass relays, the Citadel, our ship drives. It's all based on Prothean technology. This is big, Shepard. The last time humanity made a discovery like this, it jumped our technology forward 200 years. But Eden Prime doesn't have the facilities to handle something like this. We need to bring the beacon back to the Citadel for proper study. Obviously, this goes beyond mere human interests, Commander. This discovery could affect every species in Council space. It never hurts to have a few extra hands on board. The beacon is not the only reason I'm here, Shepard. Nihilus wants to see you in action, Commander. He's here to evaluate you. Guess that explains why I bump into him every time I turn around. The Alliance has been pushing for this for a long time. Humanity wants a larger role in shaping interstellar policy. We want more say with the Citadel Council. The Spectres represent the Council's power and authority. If they accept a human into their ranks, it shows how far the Alliance has come. I was impressed when I studied the reports from Torfin. A grim business, but you got the job done. That's why I put your name forward as a candidate for the Spectres. Why would a Turian want a human in the Spectres? Not all Turians resent humanity. Some of us see the potential of your species. We see what you have to offer to the rest of the galaxy, and to the Spectres. We are an elite group. It's rare to find an individual with the skills we seek. I don't care that you're human, Shepard. I only care that you can do the job. I assume this is good for the Alliance. Earth needs this, Shepard. We're counting on you. I need to see your skills for myself, Commander. Eden Prime will be the first of several missions together. You'll be in charge of the ground team. Secure the beacon and get it onto the ship ASAP. Nihilus will accompany you to observe the mission. What do you know about the Protheans? Just what they taught us in school. They were a technologically advanced species that ruled the galaxy 50,000 years ago. Then they vanished. Nobody really knows how or why, though I've heard plenty of theories. But everyone agrees, galactic civilization wouldn't exist without them. Their citadel is the very heart of galactic society. And without their mass relays, interstellar travel would be impossible. We all owe the Protheans a great debt. I'd like to know more about Eden Prime before we touch down. It's a peaceful farming world, but it represents something much bigger. Eden Prime is one of our oldest and most successful colonies. It proved we were ready to face the challenges of settling new worlds, to forge a place for humanity beyond Earth. It symbolizes humanity's growth and evolution as a spacefaring species. And after this, it will be known as the world where humans made a discovery of galactic importance. Why is this beacon so important? All advanced galactic civilization is based on Prothean technology. Even yours. If we hadn't discovered those Prothean ruins buried on Mars, 
we'd still be stuck on Earth. That was just a small data cache. Who knows what we can learn from this beacon? What if it's a weapons archive? We can't let it fall into the wrong hands. Like who? The Attican Traverse isn't the most stable sector of Citadel space. There are plenty of raiders and criminal groups active in the region. They might figure a Prothean beacon is worth the risk of attacking an Alliance ship. Plus, Eden Prime is right on the border of the Terminus systems. The Attican Traverse is under Citadel protection. If the Terminus systems attack, it's an act of war. Technically, yes. But some of the species in the Terminus might be willing to start a war over this. The last thing the Council wants is to get dragged into a major conflict with the Terminus systems. We have to keep this low-key. Just give the word, Captain. We should be getting close to Eden- Captain, we got a problem. What's wrong, Joker? Transmission from Eden Prime, sir. You better see this. Bring it up on screen. Get down! out after that. No comm traffic at all. It just goes dead. There's nothing. Reverse and hold at 38.5. Status report. 17 minutes out, Captain. No other Alliance ships in the area. Take us in, Joker. Fast and quiet. This mission just got a lot more complicated. A small strike team can move quickly without drawing attention. It's our best chance to secure the beacon. Grab your gear and meet us in the cargo hold. Tell Alenko and Jenkins to suit up, Commander. You're going in.